Hi, everybody. As Jen said, my name is Andrew Boardman. It's really an honor to be here and to have an opportunity to speak with everybody today and tell you a little bit about a project that we've been developing over the past few months. Um, as you can see, the project is called Serving.Green, and it's both an educational tool and a web-based model for designing and developing rich websites. Our hope is that this today will tie in nicely to some of the other conversations that we're going to have today about sustainable design practices and the need to rethink our, our carbon lives in a digital space. The website we'll discuss, Serving.Green, represents our attempt at jumpstarting multiple conversations about serving a digital, uh, green digital product. Um, so this talk is bro broken down into two parts. First, I'll provide an overview of the project and discuss why we need to take a very different approach to building the web. And then my colleague, Dan Lamb, who is sitting next to me, will discuss some of the technologies and approaches used in building and serving this website. So first, I'll just give you a little bit of background about us. Um, as Jen mentioned, I, I run a company called Man Overboard. Um, I should mention that um, our primary goal is to help conscious companies advance their mission, deliver new ideas, and connect meaningfully with their, with their audiences. We're also a, a certified B Corporation, which as many of you might know is a new type of company that uses business to help solve some of the world's most challenging social and environmental issues. Part of our work as a B Corp and, and a business focused on sustainability is to advocate for forward-looking design and technology practices, which brings us to the topic today. I just want to encourage everyone to look into B Corps or become affiliated with B Corps if, if you can. It's a, it's a great movement. This is just a few of the clients with whom we work. You can see that many of them are in the impact investment space, which I think is really changing the way we think about um, environment and, and sustainability. Okay, greening the web. When I broach the subject to most people, it sounds very strange, right? So after all, isn't the web already green? We're not cutting down trees to print brochures or using messy ink in magazines to communicate our ideas, right? How much energy could the web actually use? That's what people say. So the reality is that the web is in no way green. The vast majority, about three quarters last time I looked, of the internet continues to be powered by fossil fuels. And as the internet grows, we're using more and more non-renewable energy to power it. Every time we click a link or upload a file or watch a video online, we make use of these huge data centers that are mostly powered by dirty energy. According to one source, the internet will soon amount to nearly 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide annually, or approximately 10% of global electricity usage. So all that data coming up and down the pipes could be both, both massively reduced and powered by renewable energy if we desire. So as builders of the web, we have a choice. We can either build green sites and applications or we can choose to ignore it. Um, there are many challenges around greening the web, but really two key ones. First, we need to start building more efficient websites and applications and tools that use less energy. It's clear that websites have gotten much larger and unnecessarily so. The average web page, including video, images, code, and copy, amounts to nearly 2.5 megabytes in size. That's about 20 times the size of a page in 2003, when pages were built to be really light and quick because bandwidth was also tight. If you think of your website as a bicycle, you might not need the super tricked out low rider you see on the right. You probably just need something awesome that's on two wheels, which you see on the left. The second main challenge is that we need to host those same websites and applications and tools with renewable energy or the very nearest equivalent. Many larger data centers are becoming more conscious of their energy consumption, and they're working on becoming more energy efficient. Some are even adapting renewable energy full bore, like Apple and Google, as you probably know. However, the rate of growth of the web is outpacing data providers' efficiencies and their green energy commitments. So on the left, you can find a refinery that is belching out tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. On the right is a geothermal plant in Iceland. The stuff coming out the stacks on the right is just steam. That's plain H2O. That's the way we need to go. But here's the good news. that Greening the internet is within our reach, and anyone concerned and everyone concerned about the fate of the planet can help. In September 2016, we launched a web-based project called Serving.Green. 
that helps explain the numerous challenges of overbuilt websites and fossil fuel data centers, and to become uh, to provide some more concrete solutions to a general audience. The site was a result of a series of weekly conversations with Tim Frick of Mighty Bytes, who will be speaking later today, and John Haugen of Third Partners, which is a sustainability consultancy in New York. So together we collaborated and created this site called Serving.Green. The concept of serving not only refers to data or serving data, but also to serving visitors and users of our digital products. So I see this website as an ongoing educational tool to help us start and continue a conversation about our digital economy and how it can also become part of a green economy. So we had four goals. First, to educate the public about the need for hosting websites and applications efficiently with renewable energy. Second, to provide a user-friendly, memorable, and straightforward way for visitors to understand the issues around the sustainable web. Third, to offer a small and useful set of resources that can be easily and readily updated. And fourth, to provide a model for creating a beautiful and engaging web experience on a modest page size budget. We're gonna to touch on each of these. I'll talk about the first three, and Dan will talk about the fourth, which is the most important, I think. So the first goal in terms of educating the public this is key to the success of all sustainability initiatives, especially in an era of what we have as uh, alternative facts and the devaluing of expertise and basic science. To date, the only large organization that has been successful in talking about greening the internet is Greenpeace. All the other organizations that I love and support, and I won't name them here, are having a tough time connecting the dots between how our digital footprint impacts our carbon footprint. The second goal, which is creating a user-friendly and memorable platform for site visitors, goes hand in hand with education. Putting out a white paper or a plain vanilla website with a bunch of facts in Times New Roman will no longer work in today's world of video enhanced reporting and short attention spans. As designers, we really need to quickly empower ourselves to tell interesting, accessible stories about our most pressing challenges in a way that will resonate with and connect with viewers. I, I really believe this is urgent. Fighting facts with facts is very important, but if we can do it using design and the tools of good UX, which is why we're all here today, we have a much more powerful vehicle for communicating with the public. So as you can see from these screenshots, the Serving.Green website is meant to showcase key statistics and tweetable factoids that the average person who builds the web or who uses the web, meaning most everybody here, would find surprising and hopefully will spur them to take some action. So this, this uh, brings us to the third screenshot, which essentially uh, the goal is to provide a useful set of resources that the site visitors can find out how to find, how to green their website um, and how they can approach a digital project with sustainability in mind. Um, we provide five key recommendations for folks on the site, uh, including finding a green host, which is the single most important thing you can do to create a green digital product. The other recommendations are to assess and refine your site's assets and to talk with your designer, developer, and host about serving things green. Having that conversation is very important. But here's the challenge we face, and where I'd love to hear from the community. The stakes of climate change are so high, and we need to support a green economy at all costs. We're, we're definitely thinking about the next steps for the site and where it goes in terms of education and advocacy. And I'd love to hear your suggestions um, as to how serving.green can make a difference. So as I mentioned, the fourth goal for Serving Green is to be a model for creating lightweight but richly designed sites. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dan, to discuss some of the technologies and approaches he used to build the site and to optimize its performance. All right, so uh, Dan Lamb here. Uh, I'm the lead developer here at Man Overboard. Uh, and I was tasked with trying to make a, a pretty nice website using a lot of the modern things that people are expecting nowadays, such as uh, high resolution images, uh, pretty good resolution video, uh, and animation and other effects. Um, I, the, as Andrew already mentioned, the average page size of a web page nowadays is in the ballpark of 2.4 megabytes. Uh, and our goal was to definitely come under that that uh, as much as we could um, without sacrificing uh, the experience. So my talk is gonna be focused on making websites more green simply by trying to reduce your file size as much as you can. 
Um, and by reducing your file size as much as you can, you'll reduce the amount of energy that's going to need to be consumed to uh, display it. Okay, uh, I'm going to be going through seven things that any web designer can do to try to keep their file size down. So let's jump into the first one. Images. Images are a big one. So in the early days of websites where everything was just plain text, um, it was done because we had to. There was no bandwidth. But as soon as we had enough bandwidth to start pumping images through it, that's what we started doing. And as bandwidth gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we start pumping more and more high-resolution images through the pipes. So the first thing is, uh, and the first way to deal with images and reduce your file size is just to limit the number of images that you use. To really strongly consider every asset that you're putting into your project. Uh, and this sheet, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is all of the images that are used on our page. Um, next up uh, is just the idea of resolution. You know, oftentimes, if the image you're using isn't super highly detailed, you can reduce the JPEG quality quite a lot without actually sacrificing the experience. Uh, and on that note, especially if you're tinting the layer back with uh, a dark overlay or some sort of color, the darker or more opaque that overlay is, the less resolution you probably need. Uh, similarly, um, aside from just reducing, sorry, I think I actually said, was talking about JPEG quality in the last slide, but JPEG quality, again, is a big thing. It, depending on how big an image is going to be displayed or how much you're going to obscure it in other ways, you should really try to bring those quality sliders down as much as you can before you start to uh, feel bad about yourself putting it on your project. <laughs> Uh, and another big way to deal with images is to detect the size necessary based on the browser window or the device that's accessing your website and just send them an image that's uh, appropriate for that device. So for instance, nowadays 4K televisions are all the rage and some people are actually viewing websites on them. Um, but you, there's no reason to serve a 4K resolution image to somebody's iPhone. Retina displays are not that good yet. Okay, moving on from images, uh, the next one is videos. Videos on web pages are a little more recent than images, of course, um, but you just you see them everywhere nowadays. And in order to reduce the file size of your videos. Uh, you pretty much have all the same things as images uh, plus time. So our page, we use this uh, this awesome image of steam bellowing out of uh, a geothermal um, energy plant in Iceland. Uh, and you'll see the video quite a lot through the project. Um, based on the level of detail that's in this video, similar to images, uh, we decided that for our needs, using 720p resolution was good enough, even when viewed on a, you know, a full HD 24-inch monitor. We said that that was good enough, um, so that's what we went with. Yes, 720p. Uh, the new thing with video that you don't have to worry about with images is time. Uh, so the stock that we're using when we originally purchased it was. Uh, memory, it escapes me, it was between either 30 seconds or 60 seconds, but as you can imagine, you know, it, if a camera in the shot is not moving, and it's not, why not just set up a seamless loop for the video? So I was able to set up a pretty darn good loop that you don't notice looping in using only four seconds, so that was a pretty drastic reduction uh, in file size without losing any of the effect. And one of the more interesting ones we discovered while working on this project uh, was 
that the positive impact we could make by using HTML5's video tag. Originally, we were trying to host our video on YouTube so that we could offload uh, the serving of that asset to uh, a fairly green source. Um, but once we actually got it in place and we had the embed running, we found that we were actually, uh, it was costing us over a meg in scripts just required to play the video. So by skipping that um, and just using the video tag, we were able to save quite a bit. The scripts were actually significantly longer than the video itself was. So not acceptable to us. OK, uh, next, the idea of reusing. So as you saw in an earlier slide, we, we have just the four, um, four beautiful images and one video. Um, but we actually reuse the video on and off throughout the entire length of the project. Uh, and we do that um, by filtering the video with CSS or other techniques. So the first version that you see is uh, a full color version of the video. That's how we saved out the file and uploaded it to our servers. Uh, next, we use CSS3 to grayscale the video in some cases. And lastly, we just put a semi-transparent overlay on top of the video to make it look like we also had a green version, right? So we only have the one asset, but because of the ways that we filtered it, we were able to reuse it and uh, make it feel like something new as you scroll through the page. Uh, the next topic uh, is fonts. Um, web fonts are so common nowadays, I'd, I'd say you're probably hard pressed to find a site where someone isn't using at least one web font somewhere. Um, but like anything else, uh, if you use too much of them, you're going to be costing yourself um, more, more bandwidth requirement. Uh, so for this project, we decided to use one font family and these four weights. Now, it, it still shows up as an intermediate load time uh, in Google Web Fonts um, interface. Um, but the point here is not always to produce a microscopically tiny website. The goal is, you know, in every case, you're just trying to make it as small as you can, given the needs and the constraints of your project, right? OK, uh, the next topic is text masking. Um, on this website, we're trying to do something pretty fancy where we use text as a cookie cutter and then allow other assets, such as the images or the videos, show through the text. Now, we, we started off by going down a, a fairly deep rabbit hole of some advanced techniques using uh, SVG and, and Canvas. And in the end, they were just either too complicated or the scripts, there was just too much going on to try to get them to work. So we decided to go super low tech um, and just use a really, really big image with uh, PNG transparency. Now, as you probably know, uh, using the, um, the, the fancy pings that offer you anti-aliased transparency, there's usually a pretty big file size cost. But in our case, since the giant images that we're using are a single color with transparency, the file size is still quite small. So uh, we found that it was very acceptable. So we're really just using huge images with text cut out uh, with considerations made for the different aspect ratios of devices that would be viewing it, and then stacking it on top of other assets. All right. Uh, next, number six, this is a really, really big one. Um, and that's because no matter how small you get your file size down on your websites, um, it's 
not really going to matter if the people you're hosting it with are burning fossil fuels anyways, right? So uh, this particular website is actually powered by possibly that very same geothermal power station that we uh, feature so much through our website. Um, we are hosting the site in Iceland, um, and the hosts that we're using, and also, if I'm not mistaken, all or the majority of the country of Iceland, uh, is powered by geothermal and hydroelectric power. So really taking the time to investigate the host that you're using and seeing uh, what powers them is just a really, really awesome way to reduce the environmental impact of your websites and applications. Uh, and the last one is just a little bonus, um, the idea of using hosted libraries. So um, these are just a couple of examples of folks who are taking uh, script libraries that a lot of us designers are using over and over and over again. Uh, and by allowing a hosted library to host some of your resources, um, the benefit there is that anyone who has already used the same uh, hosted library to download a particular script, such as Angular or, or jQuery, uh, they'll be able to skip downloading it again. Uh, and just use the version that's sitting in their browser cache. Um, so that pretty much wraps up my talk for what we did with Serving Green. Um, if you haven't yet heard of it or had a chance to look at it, uh, this is actually the URL. We're running on the, the newish .green top level domain. So if you just type in serving.green into your web browser, it'll take you right there. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. And if you want a little bit more information, uh, Dan's written a blog post uh, at our website at manableboard.com. And please feel free to reach out to us at, at any time. You, there's our contact info. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>